and I also, also start to record the webinar. Should we start or? Yeah, we can, we can wait for another couple of minutes until okay. everyone joins, but uh, maybe until this is happening, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, Friday seminar to the SEM, which is uh, financed by the LABEX SEMEV. And we're very grateful to uh, Grinium for providing us with a Zoom webinar and helping us with the technical side of things. So thank you very much. Um, for everyone who is uh, um, freshly joining, you can, of course, as with every seminar, ask your questions. So at the bottom of, uh, your, of your window, of the Zoom window, you should see a Q&A tab where already during the seminar you can ask your questions. And you can also vote up um, questions that have been asked by other people so that we have an idea of, of um, which questions you all think are important. And finally, there's the chat uh, via which you can contact us or everyone to uh, if you have technical issues or something like that. Um, yes, I think uh, Finn, if you want, you can start. Yeah, so uh, we're very happy to uh, host today Simon Seger, um, who came over here to Montpellier for the pleasure of good weather. Unfortunately, it's not here today, and we're very British. So, uh, Simon Seger, he, uh, uh, he's born in 1982, so he's a young guy of 37 years old, not yet 40. Um, and uh, he started his career in research with a PhD at the University of Reading. Uh, obviously, this was not quite his uh, optimal weather. So, uh, uh, well, the study with James Cook was in uh, Eastern Australia on uh, parasitic fig wasps. Uh, then after that, he moved to Europe, uh, uh, so to uh, the Czech Republic, to South Bohemia, where he stayed for eight years. Uh, that was between 2012 and 2019. So, well, South Bohemia may not be the optimal climate for Simon Seger, so his field work was in New Guinea with uh, uh, all the projects that are developed by uh, Wojciech Nowotny. So uh, this involves a lot about, uh, um, well, what he's going to talk about today. So maybe it's not so important that I present all of this. And then beyond that, there was something. So this is all about uh, uh, nasty insects feeding on plants and nasty insects feeding on insects feeding on plants and nasty insects feeding on insects that feed on insects that feed on plants. So it's traffic networks and things like that. And in between, he had a spell of looking at nice animals, which were insects feeding on plants, but being mutualists. So that was fig wasp. So basically, this is uh, his career. And then uh, last year, he got a position as a lecturer in entomology uh, at the uh, Harper Adams University in the UK. So he's planning to do field work somewhere in Africa, I think, just because Reading is, uh, no, Adams Harper University is not that good climate. So, well, I let him present now. Okay, thank you, Finn. Okay. Um, so if I share, I will start to share screen. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction, Finn. I'm just going to start my timer um, so that I can I can I can not keep the time. Um, I'd just like to say thanks everyone for, for turning up. And now I'm going to give a, a talk um, about some of the work as Finn's been saying that we've we've conducted in New Guinea. So I've been really lucky that I've worked some very, very, um, very fantastic places over the past few years and been lucky to be involved in some, some really nice research with lots of good people. So I'm going to, firstly, I'm going to talk about the plan of the, the, the presentation. So initially, I want to talk about some of those people and, and some of the places, um, the, the people behind the research that really make, make things happen. Um, then I'm going to talk about three published um, 
papers. So I'll, I'll try to go through those relatively briefly, just pulling out the important parts or what I think are the important parts anyway. Um, and then I'm going to present some new results in section five. Uh, I have a very, very brief section on, on what has Finn alluded to, what, I'm, what I'd like to do next. Um, and this is kind of a, a conceptual extension of, of the stuff in the talk, but it's on a different system um, in, a, with a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different setting. So first, I'm going to introduce some of the people and the places. So um, I've been really, really lucky to work in New Guinea. So it's a fantastic place. It's a, it's a fantastically diverse place. Um, sorry, Professor Simon Leather's just ringing me on, on the other line. So I'm just going to hang, hang up on him. Um, so it's, it's incredibly diverse. It's, um, it's estimated that about 0.5% of the world's um, species live um, so it's 0.5% of the world's land mass, but about 5% of the world's species live in New Guinea. So New Guinea's got a really high rate of endemism. So like many montane, rugged, tropical um, countries, it's got um, a high level of endemism and a high level of um, species turnover with elevation, which both contribute to these, to these, um, these red spots on this map. Um, okay, so if I get back into this. So, Finn also mentioned the work of um, Professor, Professor Wojtek Novotny. So Wojtek has been working in New Guinea now for 20, 30 years, and he's done some, some fantastic research on uh, all sorts of elements of insect-plant interaction. So I'm going to briefly introduce some of those previous um, papers as to set up the story um, for some of the work that we've been doing. But the New Guinea Benetang Research Centre is, is based in this, um, this lovely tropical lagoon. Um, you can see the green circle just hovering over the top in Madang, which is in, which is in the New Guinea part of Papua New Guinea, so, that, so the north, uh, slightly wetter part of the country. Um, still quite a lot of dense rainforest um, and some fantastic uh, knowledge in, um, in the people working there. So often they have a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of the, of the local forest, um, what, the, what the species are, how the interactions are, are playing out. So we work very closely alongside um, our New Guinean nationals to, to explore their forests alongside them. And um, uh, one of Wojciech's approaches is, is, is very um, natural history based. So we do a lot of collecting and rearing of insects on plants. We do lots of morphotyping, um, lots of DNA barcoding to establish differences between males, females, um, different species, cryptic species. And a lot of this work is um, is done at BRC um, and and the kind of extension lab. So this sign in the bottom right hand corner is from Ohu Bush Lab, which is a which is a lab um, in a in a in a nice village called Ohu that 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 where George Wyman did a lot of his kind of fig wasp research. Um, we we we're, we're based largely there with Bruce Asua. So Bruce Asua is um, is hiding behind that, doing his best to hide behind that big log uh, in the top left hand corner. Um, he's a fantastic researcher. He's, he's, he's probably one of the best people to work with in terms of figs in New Guinea. Um, and New Guinea is like a kind of Disneyland for figs. Uh, they're just everywhere. Um, there's, and, there's 150 species of, of fig in New Guinea. Um, many of them found in the areas that we work in, but, but Bruce has a fair, fair oversight of many of those species. He's worked very closely with George, so there's, that's George Wyblin holding a, a specimen of Ficus damaropsis in his hand, um, and of course Wojciech Novotny. So this is a sort of first generation of fig researchers, and a nice story, uh, a nice part of the story is that if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, the guy, um, I can't hover, he's got green welly boots and kind of beige shorts, and he's standing up with a blue t-shirt and a blue bag, that's, that's Emil Bruce, or, or Mentap Sisson as he's sometimes known, who is Bruce's son standing with my PhD student Daniel in, in, in a village in, in New Guinea Highlands. So a lot of this knowledge is transferred to the next generation, um, including New Guinean PhD students like Leggy, who's, who's, who's doing his best to look like he's concentrating on his computer when he knows he's being photographed. Um, so these are some of the people. Um, some of my PhD students that I've been directly involved in, Dr. Martin Wolf at the top, uh, who did a lot of this work on fig herbivores, um, and Dr. Daniel Soto Valaris at the bottom, who's who's now at Prague, has done a lot of really nice work on the population genetics of, of some of these species. So I think it's just it's nice to be able to talk about 
some of the people behind the work and introduce introduce them as well as just the, the research itself. So the second part of the research of the talk, or the, or the first kind of part of the research element, um, is about predicting interactions in lowland forests in New Guinea. Um, New Guinea forest is is fantastic. Um, there's no other word for it really. It's incredibly species rich. And there's there's a lot where it's often in good condition because of the local the way that the land is is owned by a kind of customary land rights. It's quite hard to buy up big logging concessions in New Guinea. Um, so a lot of the forest is in pretty good condition and you can see it for, for miles around. And this is a this is a view from Bruce Asua's garden actually at the top of um, top of the hill look at overlooking the butterfly reserve in Ohu. Um, and this is this is slightly disturbed forest. You can see the palm trees, um, you can see some gaps developing. But but this is kind of typical of of that this particular region, this particular part of Ohu of uh, of Bodang. It's a kind of matrix of primary and secondary rainforest, um, which is also interesting because it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of agricultural approach is to it's this sort of swooden agriculture, the slash and burn, where people will kind of fell a hectare of forest, have a garden, and then let that, that, that forest regenerate. So you do get a, a genuine, in combination with a, with a very active tectonic um, well, landscape, you get a lot of gaps created in the forest. You do get a lot of these secondary species cropping up. So it makes it quite an interesting habitat to work in. Um, it's incredibly complicated. So this is a slide that I've stolen directly from one of Wojciech Novotny's presentations. Um, and this is a food web from their 2010 paper in Journal of Animal Ecology. And it, it, it's kind of mind blowing really. So this is just a snippet of the whole thing. You can see along the bottom, the red section is the bit that we're focusing in on. This is an interaction web between, um, between depending on the data set, up, upwards of, of 150 plus plants and um, 9,600 insects, 200 species of tree. And there are 50,000 trophic interactions in total. So it's a really complicated web um, and uh, there's lots, been lots of work done on it, but we're trying to really go beyond this descriptive um, aspect and, and understand and predict some of this, some of this complexity now. So, if we break down some of this complexity, um, we can see that a lot of these, a lot of these plant genera that are are present in lowland rainforests in New Guinea, but but this but this also holds true for um, tropical forests more largely, uh, is represented by what what EJH Corner, um, and as Finn knows, you can't study figs um, without, without studying Corner, called this large tropical genera. Um, so that's EJH Corner there with his, with his trained monkey. So his monkey used to climb up the tree and collect voucher specimens for him. Um, I think that's a much nicer approach than the kind of Russell Wallace approach of shooting, uh, shooting down butterflies with shotguns and, and that kind of thing. So it's, um, he's an interesting guy. Uh, Al, Al, um, Alwyn Gentry also kind of came to the same conclusion with his species swarms. And, and what the message is, is that a lot of lowland tropical rainforest is represented by these, these diverse genera. So there are thousands of species of Cisigium um, and Psychotria, hundreds of species of Ficus, hundreds of species of Macaranga. And a lot of the, a lot of the interactions in these webs focus around these big genera. So if we can understand what's going on in these genera, then, then we can kind of part, we can start to unravel the complexity of these, of these networks. Um, so typically these, these campaigns are large. So these are some of the guys in the field. Um, I think it's nice to show some pictures of how this all works. So there's, that's a typical field lab. You can see the, the processing there. You've got people morphotyping insects, rearing caterpillars, there's some photography going on in the corner. Um, and this is a sort of organized biodiversity campaign on a, on an epic scale, really. It's, it's work that, 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 I think um, technically in some aspects could probably be replaced with, with DNA um, meta barcoding, but you don't get the same resolution and, and the same insights, the same natural history insights as, we, as we're starting to get from some of this. And I hope I can pick up on those in some of the last slides. Um, so that's an action shot really. Um, um, and if we zoom in even further, so we, we've kind of reduced our plant diversity. If we, if we kind of get rid of some of the insects as well and reduce our insect diversity, we, we're going to focus primarily on the larval leaf chewers. And that's a guild that's that basically caterpillars. They're, they're interesting because they've got an intermediate host specificity. They're not, they're not particularly, not dramatically host specific in the way that a gawley insect or a leaf sucker is, or, 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 or a, um, a kind of 
um, mining insect, but they're not as generalist as a big, a big adult phasmid or something like that. So they're, they're quite interesting because they've got a certain degree of structure in their, in their specificity. Um, and if we, if we scale back up and we look, over, look across space as well as um, in one location, we can see that some of these networks are pretty stable. Uh, might be something to do with the fact that New Guinea is quite young, but, but basically these networks can, can be quite continuous over broad patches of, of tropical rainforest um, in northern New Guinea. So this is the, the turnover in community structure across the, some of the big genera that, we, that we're talking about. So um, what we want to do, what our aims were, was to try to understand, and this is kind of a, this is a spoiler slide really for people who can't, can't follow or don't want to follow the whole, whole thing. We look, we, we're interested in trying to measure some of the traits associated with these plants and match that with um, insect community composition. So I'm going to show a lot of multivariate figures, CCAs, PCAs, that kind of thing, quite often imposing the community of insects um, and then correlating that with with plant traits. And this, in this case, we've got the effect of polyphenols, so things like tannins and, um, and, uh, and, um, and flavonoids and that kind of thing on the community structure of insects across three of these big genera. And we can immediately see that there's a huge effect of chemical composition on, on how these communities look. So Macaranga, a U4 with incredibly high oxidative activity and polyphenol content has a very distinct community, for, for example, from ficus, which is, which is relatively low. It still has some interesting polyphenol chemistry, but it's not quite as active as the others. So this is the kind of, uh, kind of approach we're trying to take. Um, and I'm going to just, just whiz through some results from a, from a paper published in 2017, where we, where we tried to tease apart we wanted, well, our, aim, our, our aim was to kind of get, around, get our heads around what the, the fact that herbivore specialization appears to function at the genus level. So you get quite high specialization for, for genera of plants, of, of herbivores across genera of plants, rather than the species level. So you often get genus specialists. Um, but the phylogenetic distance between these hosts doesn't entirely explain herbivore assemblies. So there's something, there's something else going on. And, and we know from know from multiple studies and a long, a long, a long history that, that plant chemistry is, is, is an important proximate and evolutionary driver of, of um, insect community structure. So our aim was to use host use data of insect and insect and plant phylogenies as well as in um, ecological traits to try and predict some of these herbivore assemblages. So here we're interested in bipartite phylogenies, the phylogenies of the insects as well as the plants. Um, and we took an approach, so this borrowed quite heavily on some of the ideas of um, Ehrlich and Raven, particularly Joy and, and Krepsy from some of their, so I started this postdoc in 2012. So a lot of the ideas um, that, that were kind of ingrained in my thinking were, were going around at that time. And I think some of them stood the test of time pretty well, actually. There, there was a lot of thought about how islands uh, were, were a good model for representing um, plant genera. So big, big islands, big genera, lots of species, um, lots of habitat, phylogenetic isolation, sort of directly, directly relatable to, to geographic isolation on, of islands. So we started to think about how we could predict some of this, some of this island topography and how some of these distances could help us understand insect plant communities. Uh, we also wanted to include natural enemies. We didn't manage to get around to doing that, unfortunately, um, in this study, and plant defensive traits. And we wanted to use bipartite phylogenies to try to determine some of these drivers of insect plant um, community structure. Just looking at the time. Okay, so that, that probably can. So this is this is you know um, I've got I've got two young children, so a lot of my time is spent uh, reading pretty high caliber literature, uh, such as the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, by Eric Carl, and this is a this is an approximation of our of our of our scientific approach. We basically wanted to predict host use across the phylogeny um, of a load of angiosperm plants in New Guinea, and the probability of occurrence of particular guilds of caterpillar um, species of caterpillar across these across these plants. Um, slightly more slightly more impressive uh, in some ways uh, representation. This is the angiosperm. This is the angiosperm working group three phylogeny, um, and this is these are all the groups, the major groups of, of plant um, that, that we sampled. So we try to, you can see the black circles and the white numbers. These are the we, we basically try to pinpoint members of the entire um, the diversity of the angiosperm phylogeny. Obviously, not the entire phylogeny that would be ridiculous, but but representatives of, of 
of species involved for different, different parts of the branching pattern um, as our study sample. So in the end, um, we chose 88 species of plant and we measured um, polyphenol uh, activity and content and um, we quantified insect plant interactions, so the, the community composition. And we focused on, and we generated phylogenies for both plants and insects. And we focused on two, two of my favorite um, caterpillar groups. Uh, they're not just my favorite because they turn up a lot in my light trap. They're also my favorite because they're incredibly diverse. And they represent two of the most, Noctoidea, obviously a, a very, very big group, but Geometri Geometridae and Pyrenoidae, two huge groups of, um, of, of, of insects. And we, we, this is a, a good representation. We kind of made these co-phylogeny plots um, and we tried to match up the phylogenetic uh, information from the, the, the plants and the insects. We used a, a modeling approach. So Matt Helmus and uh, Charles um, and Ives' uh, phylogenetic bipartite linear models to basically predict um, the, the activity, the, the polyphenol activity. So on the, on the right hand side of that heat map, you've got the predicted activity and then on the left hand side you've got the observed abundance and what we could what we could do is we could we could predict um occurrence of uh presence or absence of of some of these moths pretty well using chemical data we couldn't do it for the pyrenoids but we could do it for the geometrids um and our our cor the correlations between our observed models so the first figure three and our and our and our observed sort of predictions, uh, our predicted occurrence versus our observed occurrence were, were pretty good. Um, and on the, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see these are just um, logistic regression plots with, with varying degrees of data pumped into them. So you've got just the, the plain phylogeny on the, on, on, the, on the first plot, then we added some trait, then you've got what traits on, on the lower plot. And then when you add traits and phylogeny, so chemistry and phylogeny, you can predict pretty well some of this occurrence. And we managed to do this in a totally unsampled uh, chemically Kind of novel uh, setting in a, in a felled hectare of forest, as well as our as well as our our, our plots in the lowland forest. I'm just wary of time. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, Emmanuel. It goes a lot a lot quicker when you're doing it this way. So we can conclude that herbivore host breadth is complicated, uh, but it's predictable, um, and evolutionary history and plant traits seem to be important. And these predictive models um, might actually be quite useful when, we, when we're talking about things like pests. Um, how we can how we can understand the distribution of pest species. So I didn't show the figures, but we actually pre predicted the the host range of some of some of some pest species pretty well, um, even when it came to invasive plant species in New Guinea. So, so so some of these things might be quite useful in a real way as well. Um, okay, so this is the only picture of a fig wasp. Of course, it's a it's a Plistodontes, um, my favourite genus of fig wasp in the um, in the, in the centre. Someone likened them to the kind of Ferrari of the insect world. I think that's pretty flattering. They're, they're, they're very cool insects. But the rest of the talk is really about um, fig herbivores. Um, and so we're zooming in from looking at a whole range of plants, a whole panel of plants, to, to specifically looking at figs. Um, and Ficus is known to be a keystone genus. So it's, it's obviously important for, for herbivores um, because it's producing fruits all year round. But it's also very, it's a big, it's a big deal for insects and um, herbivores as well. So the aim of this, of this particular section was to quantify the caterpillar community associated with 21 species of fig and determine the role of chemical composition um, in those communities. So the figure above is a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a, um, spoiler as well. That's just a PCA, just a simple PCA of community structure of Figs with their three-letter codes, and you can see that you get a large island of of, um, of community structure, which is actually broadly similar. There's a bit of variation, but but you get insects across those hosts that kind of they can share hosts. And then the, the dots in red are the, are the things which which kind of really stand out as being as being quite as quite distinct. And we're going to try to explore what drives some of these some of these distinctions in insect community composition. So. A really quick flyby of um, of uh, the evolution of plant defences. So this is a huge field. I can't possibly uh, can't possibly try to summarise it effectively in in one slide, but I'll I'll go for it. So there's been a lot of big genus scale studies of um, the evolution of plant defences over time. So they're kind of exemplified by um, Judith Bacara, um, Anirag Agarwal, um, um, these kind of 
um, Mark Johnson, this, this, kind of, this kind of collection of work that shows there are really two, 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 two main drivers of plant defensive chemistry when we talk about evolutionary time. Um, studies from large species rich tropical genera um, have, have, have shown that in some cases you have a kind of escalation, what we, what we refer to as an escalation of defenses over time. So, so earlier species, earlier diverging species in the phylogeny tend to have weaker defenses and, they, and they've adapted to herbivores over time by increasing their investment in defenses um, through evolutionary time. Um, other, other authors have found that actually you get quite quite high levels of divergence between close, closely related species. This might be, might be selection for divergence in terms of avoiding sharing, um, sharing herbivores. So we, we tried to test both of these hypotheses, these scenarios in, in figs. Um, so figs are fascinating, um, as, Finn, as Finn will tell you, for lots of reasons, but they're also they're pretty fascinating because they've got a, an interesting uh, suite of, of, of plant chemistry. They've got these um, pentacyclic terpenes, they've got all sorts of terpenes, but these pentacyclic triaterpenes are um, probably quite important in defence. They, 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 they're, they're rich in polyphenols, um, not as rich as some groups, but they've still got quite a few um, interest, interesting polyphenols in there. Um, these phenyldrazoine alkaloids are, 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 very, are fascinating, so I'm hoping to talk about those in a bit more detail at the end. Um, and they've also got these cystein proteases, which basically digest the gut of the, of the caterpillars eating them. Often the leaves are quite hairy, not like a septica, but they've got these trichomes. Uh, and of course, they've got the kind of normal physical defenses that, that plants often have. Um, this is, this is, a, this is a, a bit of a, an intimidating plot. Um, but it, it's a summary of some of the key results. So what, what we found when we, when we create, recreated the phylogeny of figs and we mapped some of our traits on those figs was that there was quite a complex distribution of, of trait values. So in some cases, and we, and we tested for these, these kinds of, um, these, these, um, these patterns using uh, phylogenetic models, so looking for escalation of plant defenses or divergence in plant defense, and we found that some traits escalated across the plant phylogeny. So alkaloid, alkaloid content provides a really nice example. You can see it at the base of the phylogeny, you've got lower values and that, that kind of steadily increases towards the top. There's a clade, uh, the psychocarpus, uh, the top of the top, well, the, the bottom of the phylogeny that are really active with, with alkaloids. Um, that, but alkaloid diversity really takes a huge leap when you get into this, to this clade, the psychocarpus group. Um, um, and some of these, some of these traits are divergent. So some of them, and some of them are actually very different between close relatives, more different than you'd expect by chance. Um, um, this, is a, this is an example of, a, of a, an escalating trait. So, so something like oxidative alkaloid diversity and oxidative activity both increase um, in, a, in, their, in their values as you, as, you, as, you, as you go through evolutionary time as represented by Abaho's distance um, derived from the tree. And you can see that really clearly in, in row three of the first first plot you can see that Simon uh, yeah sorry can I interrupt you yeah. can use your pointer if you want also just to let you know ah okay excellent yes this can idea. help for these types of figures. yeah exactly thanks very much I didn't even think to do that that's a good idea so so you can see yeah this clade here this is psychocarpus um the, 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 the diversity of alkaloids suddenly takes a huge a huge leap here um and that's an important that's an important uh point to to recognize um and what does this all mean for our plants and our insects? Well, it's a complicated story, but but in sum, we've got some insects which are which are which are broadly fig fig specialists. So they're they they um they eat lots of other groups, but Corutidae as a whole have evolved um, to eat figs and a couple of other Moraceae. Um, in 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 our in our sample at least, and in New Guinea, um, and they respond to. Kind of conserved traits. So, so the carotids are, are, are pretty good at tracking, um, are pretty good at tracking um, um, the pretty good at tracking the conserved traits. Oh, okay. Have I got this the wrong way around? Okay, sorry, that's slightly the wrong way around. But what I wanted what what the what the message is is that the the specialists, um, these specialists like the carotids tend to be um, tend to be very good at, um, at eating figs and they can adapt to it but it's it's the it's the traits that are it's the traits that are conserved that that tend to that tend to have an effect on on the <clears throat> on the generalists so the generalists don't tend to be able to to respond so well the specialists tend to respond a lot 
uh, be influenced a lot more by the kinds of traits that are that are hard to follow over evolutionary time. Okay, so so there's a there's a divergent response in in herbivores between the lineages. So specialists and generalists basically respond to 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 different thing to, to different types of trait. And this disparity in trait um, difference is is kind of notable in in particular particular traits. So things like specific leaf area, this 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 doesn't tend to escalate. It tends to be quite different between close relatives rather than escalating over e evolutionary time. Um, whereas some of these conserved traits, things like um, alkaloid alkaloid diversity, these these have a these have these are kind of easier for specialists to to adapt to. They can they can track their hosts um, over time. They can they can they can develop um, mechanisms to overcome these overcome these um, these kinds of mechanisms. So alkaloids will be another good example we're going to discuss later on. Whereas generalist herbivores have have a tough time to adapt to these conserved traits because often they're, they're feeding on different different species. So when they switch back to a to a, to a, um, to, a, to a host that's got these these specialist defenses, they, they have a tougher time of, of, of dealing with them basically. Sorry, that doesn't help that some of the some of the text has actually been mixed up at the bottom, but I think I've got my point across. Um, okay, so the main the main conclusion is that specialists and generalists um, are are basically responding to, to different different types of plant defense and that that shapes these these fig communities um so another another kind of study on figs so we were interested in in lowland forest so this kind of uh this 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 aspect of, of lowland forest and we also wanted to know what would happen if we started to to study these these species along elevational trends so we know that in new guinea elevation is a big is a big deal um, we've got a lot of, a lot. It's it's one of the most species-rich uh, places in in the world, but it's also shares in common with a lot of other species-rich places. The fact that it's got these steep elevational gradients. We know there are a lot of mountain montane endemics, uh, and mountains are, are, are thought to be important in driving in driving biodiversity in general. So, we studied um, what what Emmanuel Toussaint is, is very. Sort of nicely referred to as the towering orogeny of New Guinea. So New Guinea is is both uh, an incredibly old um, in terms of its geography, geology, part of the Australasian uh, Australasian um, plate, which has obviously got lots of kind of Gondwan and lineages still still living there. It's 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 an it's an old, long isolated part of the world. But it's also very new, so it's it's the kind of collision zone for the for the Asiatic, the Indo Indo Asiatic plate. So the, you've got this big crunch zone in the middle, the, um, the 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 mountain range that goes through New Guinea, the central range, and our field site, you know, in 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 Madang, you can basically cross three different um, terrain types before you get to our field site. Um, the thinnest there is still being still kind of growing growing to this day. So it's it's interesting. It's it's an interesting place to work. In terms of the generation of biodiversity, um, we work along the the Mount Wilhelm elevational um, uh, complete altitudinal rainforest transect. So it's one of the only sites, um, only transects in the world that has complete forest across the whole thing. So we work at we work at six sites, um, and these are at 500 meter elevations, and, and we we collect all sorts of taxa from these sites. But in this case, we were interested in figs. And we wanted to quantify the caterpillar and beetle communities associated with uh, with nine species of fig. That's a that's a typo there, um, and determine the role of chemical composition and elevation in in these fig species. So, so there's another kind of cartoon figure, um, and you can see more or less what we what we wanted to do. We wanted to quantify plant chemistry. We wanted to quantify um, insect plant food webs at, at various elevations, and we wanted to try to determine how both elevation itself um, and chemical diversity influence the structure of these of these food webs, um, and this was work that was carried out. So a lot of the a lot of the food web work was carried out by a guy called Leggy Sam, who we, who we saw earlier. So he did a fantastic job of quantifying these 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 interaction networks, and we used some of his data for for this particular um, paper. Um, uh, what did we find? So we, we analyzed 142 trees from nine species of fig 
for, for, for what, what we see as what, two of the most important groups. So these are polyphenols and alkaloids. So I'll point out later who did this chemical analysis and, and, um, and some of the advances. Um, but we basically characterized a total of 29 alkaloids belonging to five alkaloid subgroups and, and 49 polyphenols. So you can, you can think of these compounds at, at, at various levels. You can think of them as individuals, so individual compounds, or you can think of groups of compounds which, which kind of broadly share um, chemical similarity. So as much as polyphenols and alkaloids are distinct, within polyphenols and alkaloids, you've got groups um, that which, which share a common structure, which, which we think may, may have a common, common function in terms of their, their biotic um, uh, activities. So this plot is a fairly straightforward um, RDA result. So it just shows us some of the, some of the basic patterns. So shows us that elevation, you've got phycoseptamines. These are, these are a group of alkaloids really only found in figs named for phycoseptica. They, they broadly increase with elevation, but you get some quite, quite contrasting trends. And this is, this is a bit of a note um, and a kind of a note that I think it's, it's quite important to, 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 to kind of say that these total content measures that, that, that are sometimes taken are, are kind of masking a lot of the chemical diversity that you actually find. Equally, a, a whole kind of metabolomic approach, which, which doesn't take into consideration the group, the groupings, the type of compounds that these are, also loses a lot of the information. So, so we, we're trying to kind of push an approach that we, we have to have to really kind of use a bit of chemical knowledge. You can't just use metabol raw metabolomic data. You have to kind of bin these things into groups, but also measures of total alkaloids or total total content don't always give you the, the true story. So, here we can see with elevations, polyphenol diversity broadly correlates with elevations. Um, elevation. There are some other other groups. Uh, unfortunately for you, Apeka, he's, he's really interested in these hydrolyzable tannins. They're, they're, not, they're not particularly strong, um, strongly correlated elevation, but they're also, they're also not that, that, that present in the samples either. But that's just a summary of where we are with how these different groups respond. Um, okay, same slide again, um, slightly different title, bigger as well, which is good. Um, okay, so in a bit more detail, we, we also kind of ran some mixed models to try to unpick some of these some of these details. And I know this; I'm aware that this is a lot of kind of a lot of information, a lot of detail on on, on particular compounds. But this will be important later, and I and I, and I think it kind of shows the need to study these these things in detail rather than from a superficial perspective. So some of these compounds, the non-flavanols, um, showed fairly mixed patterns. So these are things. These are things that have protein precipitation activity often. Um, putatively good for mammalian defense. They, they showed a bit of a mid, mid peak hump, but no, no real, no really consistent pattern. Flavanol glycosides, the kinds of things that are involved in UV protection showed a really strong positive correlation with, with elevation when you control for species identity. And you can see um, a slightly nicer way of representing these, these, these data here. And in, in the paper, you can find the species level uh, um, results as well. Alkaloids are, are a funny one. So you can see this, this maybe isn't the ideal plot to show it, but um, you can see that there's a lot of, a lot of variation in pre even just presence or absence of some of these alkaloids. So, so the mean lies kind of in the middle of, there's a lot of zeros in the data. So we analyze this as, as, um, as binary data actually in the end, but for purposes of presentation, it's, it's nice to see some of that variation as well. Alkaloids um, tend to increase uh, in diversity um, as you go up in elevation. So some of these high elevation groups, especially one particular species, is really rich in alkaloids. Um, these different groups have different patterns, but the overall trend is that there's a positive correlation. Um, so what did we find? So again, I'm going to leave I'm going to leave this slide up for anyone who's who's, who's really interested in the detail of the, of the plant chemistry. Um, obviously, everyone is, so um, that's that's not an issue, but what we really found is there were particular compounds, particular groups of compounds that were important in determining the, the composition of these food webs. So for example, alkaloid diversity and phycoseptamines um, explain not a huge amount, but some of the variation in insect community structure. Um, and then we looked, when we break down these, these, these compound groups to individual um, compounds, we can, we can explain also about 20% of the, of the variation in insect community structure. So actually not, not, as high as, not as high as we might think, not as high as, for example, when we compare across different plant genera. Um, and 
Um, if we if we break down what happens over some of the species, so these are different species of fig in different colours, we can see that alkaloid diversity and phycoseptamines have a kind of slightly different 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 loading there, different direction. Um, but the effects are the effects are there. The effects are, are, are real, but they're not huge. Um, and different compounds respond in different ways. So different compound groups, different compounds themselves tend to have different relationships with elevations and community structure. So unsurprisingly, the answer is it's quite complicated. But we can tease apart some of this here. And and, it, and I've been told um, um, by authorities that there are other other organisms out there in the world apart from plants and insects. And, and one of these are these kind of really cute looking couscouses, which are which tend to be very abundant at mid elevations. Um, and we think they might be quite important in driving some of these patterns. Uh, we've got no about the fungi. There, there are there are. It's likely that, that that some of these alkaloids are important in fungal defence. And these are these are kind of both things we'd we'd really like to study further. Uh, there's just some nice pictures of the transit. I think this, this river is absolutely beautiful until you're walking through it for about four hours and your feet are soaking wet. Um, but this is, yeah, these are just some nice, nice shots of the transect um, before the last part. So this is the, this is the, I'm broadly keeping to time. This is the last part of the talk. Um, so the aims of, the aim of this section, so I told you earlier that, that, that basically specialist herbivores tend to respond to divergent traits. So specialist herbivores tend to be tend to respond to things which diverge between close relatives because um, they're not necessarily able to adapt to some of these to some of these um, escalating compounds like like alkaloids. Um, even though I even though I cocked up the the the, the labelling of the figures, um, and one of these groups is a, is a, a really cool looking group of, of, of noctuid called Asota, um, and Asota is a is a moth that's found across um, lots of species in this section of Psychocarpus. And it's basically, um, it's, it's bright, it's bright, uh, it's brightly colored as an adult and, and as a larva. Um, and we wanted to, we wanted to understand the chemical differences between the caterpillars, the adults and the frass of this moth to try and work out what it was doing in terms of its, its, its chemical ecology. Um, and this work was possible because of all of this um, natural history and taxonomy work that, that, that kind of underpins a lot of our a lot of our a lot of our research in, in VRC. Um, they're really cool looking moss. Um, uh, the Arabids, uh, Noctoid, Noctoidae. Uh, they're, they're, in India, there's been cases of outbreaks of um, of kind of really chronic uh, illness or sort of acute illnesses related to, to caterpillars feeding on fig trees from this genus. Um, so it's likely that the frass is pretty, is, pretty, is pretty horrible if you inhale it in large amounts, so you have to be quite careful throughout the study. Um, but it was a good indication for potentially interesting results in terms of research. And I'm just going to go through the experimental design. So we basically had three species of fig, um, two species of moth. Um, we took 10 leaves per tree. So we, we studied two, two trees per species. You can see a bit more detail in the next slide. Um, and some of these, for some of these, we reared caterpillars um, and we basically collected their frass at the fifth instar. So we collected caterpillar frass. Um, and of course, um, these caterpillars, um, sorry, these caterpillars were, were then we were then able to rear them to adults. So we could, we, could, we could collect the frass from these caterpillars and rear them to adults. We could take their wings, body, and other bits of the, of the body to, to, to analyze. Uh, some of the caterpillars we had to rear to, um, we had to save as caterpillars. So they're from the same trees, but we can't, link, we can't directly link these individuals to those apart from the, the tree that they're feeding on, if that's, if that's clear. And what we did is we reared some caterpillars um, and we starved some and we collected the frass from, from the fifth instar. This is after a long study of working out what, if, dire, if these caterpillars were dyer's law of instar um, sizing. Um, and we did this across three species of fig. So we had six trees for our preliminary instar project. For the main project, we had six trees um, from three species and we took 10 leaves. We had two treatments uh, for the caterpillars. This was either to let them develop to adulthood or, or to take their, or, or to keep their um, um, frass and then take the caterpillar. And in total, we had 476 samples. So this also includes various body parts um, that, we, that we took from the caterpillars. 
uh, I've got this data on Monday, I've got these data on Monday, so um, there's a lot we can still do. So it's a bit, it's, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is recent research. There's some action shots. So we found that it was much easier to rear these caterpillars on the tree than to take the leaves off. Um, um, so, so we had a lot of trees covered in, covered in, um, in, in mesh bags. Um, and we, a bit more on the chemical analysis, this is done by a guy called Yuapeka Salmon. He's a professor of, uh, of natural chemistry, leader of the Natural Chemistry Research Group in Finland. Um, here, here he is in action. Um, he, he's constantly developing new methods to study plant chemicals. And, and, and one of the methods that we used in this study was, was kind of much newer than the previous studies. And it's metal bromic type approach in that you, you quantify all sorts of small compounds. It's really hard to quantify big things like tannins, but we quantified 214 compounds from different groups of polyphenols, alkaloids, glycinates, and cyanogenic glycosides. About 43 of these are alkaloids. So that's, that's more than we found in previous studies, but the methods are different. And this is what happens if you just do a CCA. So here you've got the open circles represent um, chemicals. So chemical composition, so species in a, in a traditional sense. Um, the closed circles represent the samples. So each sample taken, the, the sites. Um, and then we've got the, the, the correlations between these variables across different um, types of samples. So the red of the adults, the green of the caterpillars, the blue of the caterpillars, some of the caterpillars are parasitoid, parasitized, not intentionally, but they kind of produce an interesting result. Then we've got frass and leaves. So this is chemical similarity um, across these different parts. And if we break that down to just the alkaloids, so obviously there's a lot of information there and you get a really nice spread. Alkaloids, the spread's still pretty good. Um, there are basically three different types of thing that happen. So you had compounds, um, you had different groups had compounds that were really like super, remember this is a log scale as well, um, super abundant in the adults, but not present at all in the leaves. Um, so these hydrazine alkaloids are, 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 sign are not different between tree species. Interesting, there's no effect of the tree species that the caterpillar was reared on. Um, so they kind of converge actually. So despite the, the, the different history of their rearing, they, they, they produce the same compounds which aren't present in the leaves. So this, this to me suggests um, you know, maybe an example of synthesis of a novel, of a novel chemis chemical. You have other cases where the adults try their hardest to get rid of these compounds, but they're present in the leaves and the frass. Um, so these are probably compounds which are, which are not beneficial. You don't want, the adults don't want to sequester them. Um, so they kind of pump them out in their frass. They try to get rid of them. Um, and there are other compounds which, which distinguish really basically very different between groups of uh, species of fig. So this, this benzylaquinone, which is, which is an important alkaloid from the elevational um, uh, transex study, is, is really very rich in septica, uh, but, but, but isn't found in the others. So we've got all sorts of things going on. And remember this data were collected very recently, so I haven't really had time to digest it all, to be honest, but frass and leaves, are very chemically similar uh, and many compounds occur across tissue types. So a lot of these alkaloids are present in it everywhere. So there's probably a degree of tolerance, but caterpillar chemistry reflects host chemistry to some extent, but the adults tend to, tend to kind of fall. In adults reared on different species. Also remember that these are different species of a soda as well. So there's, there's there's a lot going on that needs to be picked apart. And these 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 data are 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 kind of under 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 analysis at the moment. But I wanted to give you some some insights as to, to how you can go from having these huge biodiversity studies to to to, to be really looking at the nuts and bolts, the details of how these interactions play out in nature. So a soda are probably capable of tolerating detoxify, sequestering and synthesizing alkaloids used in aposematism. Um, the caterpillar and the moth chemistry reflect host chemistry, but, but there, are, there are different effects in the adults and the caterpillars. And large scale forest studies can, can kind of throw up these really nice examples. And we've been very lucky to be involved with Binisera Research Center and the fact that they've got these resources and this, this incredible expertise. These, these guys are incredible field ecologists, um, often much better natural historians than, 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 than many of us. Um, and we've been able to do some of these, um, follow up some of these kind of, these lines of inquiry. So just to say really very quickly, and this is a bit of a plug, I guess, as well, 
Um, I'm working on a proposal at the moment to study, take a similar approach in coffee, so wild coffee. This is a really nice figure, it's not mine. Um, but there are 124 species of coffee, and these are what they, they kind of span across this wet, wet, dry gradient from West Africa to West Central Africa to Madagascar. And the herbivory pressure probably also follows a similar gradient. So what we'd like to do is to try and study some of these wild species of coffee, their insect communities, and, and hopefully relate that to, to what's going on in, in pests on, on the cultivated species, so Arabica and, and Robusta. Um, so that's, 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 I haven't really got time for much more. Just like to say thanks to everyone involved, especially the father-son combination of Bruce and Emil. He's looking a lot long, younger in this photo. That must be, that must be quite old. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got some references there, there. I'll, I'll leave those up. And I'm happy to take talk, uh, questions. I must admit, I haven't been following the questions that have been coming up because I've been too busy trying to keep to the time. Um, but but I'm right, sure so I, can, I can work them out now. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Okay, um, people can, I think people should ask their questions. Don't be shy. Uh, there's already a question by Raquel Vasconcelos. Uh, I seem to remember Raquel doesn't have a microphone from last week if it's the same person. Otherwise, you can ask the person the question directly. Um, Raquel, are you around? Okay, she's got, she's, she said, could you please tell me the reference? Yeah, yeah. The map of diversity classes you presented in the introduction. Mm -hmm. So I have to just remind myself. Okay, so this map here is from, I guess this is the one, if not, the reference is down there in the corner. And I, I, I should reference that properly at the end, actually, but I, I've kind of come to use it so much. Um, it's a really, really great piece of work. Is that, is that, the, is that the reference? I think Raquel uh, can react. If you want, you can react or expand on your question. Yeah, okay, that's it, cool. Okay. <laughs> can you open your microphone? Uh, I think she's okay, she said it's okay. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, so, well, I, I, while we wait for people uh, to ask some more questions, I had a few questions myself. I think you touched upon it towards the end, in fact, but I had a question at, from, at the very start when you were doing this co phylogenies and then uh, looking at the influence of traits of different or chemical tra traits of plants on insect communities. I was wondering if it's possible to do some match with the insect side, uh, or if there are some traits like uh, that can be typed at the whole community level, perhaps for the insects. So I don't know. Perhaps some of them would be detoxifying things. Others would be uh, whether, as you as you were showing, whether you find the same chemicals inside the insects, or I don't know. I'm not a specialist of that, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, that, no, it's a good point. So, as perhaps a yeah. So I mean, we originally we wanted to we wanted to. Uh, um, you can see that this is a this is like a terrible thing. This is a this is a figure of from a from a, a slide from a presentation I gave in two thousand and fourteen, and these things were still to be done. Um, this was done, never <laughs> included, but this this never happened. But one of the things we wanted to do was to was to take some traits from the adults, and so geometrics make it illustrate that point really well, actually. So in in Europe, there are so the autumn moth. Well, there's a load of there's a load of quite polyphagous um, geometrids that are a big problem for apple producers. They like rosaceae a lot. <clears throat> um, they the the um, they tend to go for quite polyphenol rich hosts. So a lot of the things they they they, they go for are rich in polyphenols. And there's some there are some papers that suggest that actually the, the, the polyphenols that they they take in are quite good for controlling things like pathogens and uh, an infection so it, it there's a lot more going on than than this and i think including some of the more more of the information of a, of a lepidoptera even things like body size would probably be quite important mm. um you you can see here there's a load of this group here these are all pyroloid moths and they're all feeding this is basically ficus and in geometrics there, there's nothing really eating ficus um but in, in pyroloids there's a lot of stuff eating Eating ficus, and these moths are quite distinct in their in their natural history and their and their uh. and their and their traits. So I think 
even even within these two groups, there's a lot of mileage for for studying basic life history traits. Yeah, there's this, but then I was thinking, just technically speaking, is it the same thing to do this chemical analysis on plants and or insects, or is it a different? Technique? Yeah, so um, so for the for the last study, we basically so if you can freeze dry it. Uh, and you can crush it up, right. then you can analyze it, basically. I say that on behalf of you, Apaka, but I think that's pretty much the cut and thrust of it. That, yeah, so so this would be this would be fascinating, really, to, to, to do a kind of whole a whole family level chemical ecology of, of the insects and of the of the hosts and their and their, their insects. That would be that would be amazing, actually. Yeah, that would be that'd be lovely to see. Um, because there's clearly there's clearly a lot of interesting chemical ecology going on at the kind of species level that, that it's really hard to fit into these these wider studies um so this took a long time for example but i'd like to see that other questions are there uh, like uh, some explanation for the covariance of chemicals with elevation is it uh, like uh, just because you think it's some kind of or perhaps you said it but is there some kind of just random association of some trees with elevation, or is there some things that make some chemicals more difficult to do at, di at different temperatures or things like this? Well, we, we think we think that some of these some of these chemicals are probably so there's a, there's a kind of there's this debate carbon nitrogen debate in in plant chemistry that nitrogen is needed to make some of these some of these compounds. Of course, it is, but whether these whether these basic resources and elements change with elevation is, is one possibility but I, I think that's probably not a limiting factor i think there i would if i was going to bet i think a lot of this stuff is um abiotic so for example the flavonoids are probably i would say largely for uv protection so it's quite a steep gradient it gets up to about 2700 meters is the highest elevation we sample at and, and you've got quite high levels of UV up there. So I think a lot of these things are in response to the abiotic environment. Um, there, are, there are biotic drivers that we just haven't measured. So we do, in the paper, we, we, do, we do count marsupials and there's a, there's, a, there's a trend which roughly correlates with the non-flavanols, but it's, it's kind of just a correlation. Um, but I think fungi are probably also pretty important. So a lot of the fungi, the, the fungi that, that, that go on the side of these trees probably drive the alkaloid content. So I think there's a few basic factors and abiotic factors that we haven't measured. I, I don't know if, if these things are just simply hard or easier to make. There's probably a trade-off for growth and regrowth and tolerance. So may, maybe these things are more costly. Some of the alkaloids are costly to make, but it's more if you're high in elevation, because if you lose your leaves, it's much harder to regrow that material. So you defend it, you defend it as best you can. Um, but but I don't know if, if I don't know if any one of these 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 traits is, is specifically more costly than costly or than others or kind of resource mm -hmm. dependent yeah but it's interesting if some um i mean you could say perhaps some of these chemicals are have some abiotic drivers selecting for them and then they have a side effect on uh, yeah i think that might be the case with with some of these you know, these these basically these um parenthocyanins so these are the same similar class to the, to the that you get in the in leaf senescence and um these colorations and they're, they're, they're Basically, the, the pH of the of the insect gut is is alkaloids, and, and some of these tannins work really well. Sorry, these oxidative um, chem chemicals, tannins especially, work really well in that in, in that that kind of particular chemical environment. These other groups don't really do much to they don't bind proteins in the way that they're meant to. Um, if they would be for insect defense, so we think they're probably more of a defense against generally probably a defense against some of these some of these. Um, these mammalian herbivores and actually there's been a few there's a, a really recent study where they, they they took some of the diets of these oh. insects and they and they sorry these mammals and they discovered that yes there were lots of lots of um compounds in in the in the leaves but that also yeah i think this was mostly to do with kind of carbon and, and nitrogen and phosphorus and stuff but it would be really cool to try and link link the the, the protein precipitation capacity which is meant to be at a direct Response to, to to mammalian predators, to to some of these some of these larger mammals. So I think, yeah, the insects probably have a role, but there's there's, there's a lot more going on, fungi especially. But so do we have some question by some specialists of we have some chemical ecology people in the audience, or um, I guess community ecology. Um, 
Pin, any question? Yes, maybe a small question on the uh, on the geographic variation. What, what is your expectation? You you have um, uh, you had some very neat data on Ficus septica, and uh, that is a species that covers a huge range. So, uh, mm -hmm. any things that you expect on the variation of the chemistry there? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good point. You're, you're exactly you're, you're totally right. So, Ficus septica is. Um, it's got a it's got a huge range. Some of these others, so Hispanoides doesn't. Um, Pachyrachis is an endemic to, to New Guinea. Septica definitely isn't, um, and that would be a really that would might be a, quite a neat candidate for testing. Um, if this truly is an anti herbivore defence for, for testing, if there's a gradient in herbivory, for example, so Septica gets Septica gets all the way up to Philippines or further. Oh, it goes up to Taiwan and to. Yeah. Um... Uh, it's in China as well, isn't it? In this one, Okinawa. Okay, so if there is a if there is a gradient in herbivory, for example, that would be a really nice system to to study on on that great along that gradient. My 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 kind of gut reaction would be that there probably is a difference, and that should correlate to historical levels of herbivory. So I guess the classic interpretation is that this is a this is a wet a wet forest. Um, wet, humid, evergreen forest with high rates of herbivory, and that it it, it pays off to invest quite heavily in in, in plant defence. But maybe the same defences aren't aren't needed as you as you get further north in the range and, and rates of herbivory decrease um, as you get to the other as you go slowly up towards the subtropics. It's also in Australia as well, so you could you could probably study the the, the species in some of these drier habitats as well. But that would be my that would be my yeah my feeling that the chemistry probably does vary. I think these fundamental molecules are still produced, but but perhaps in different different concentrations. But having said that, this interaction so Asota is in this one banner. There's quite a lot of Asota species, uh, and Asota gets all the way up to to northern India um, on figs. So if it's a if it's a really long long co-evolved um, long existing interaction, then perhaps Septica perhaps Septica is, is similar in all places. All right, so um, there is a question by uh, Martin Hossert. Uh, Martin, uh, do you want to ask a question yourself to make it more interactive, perhaps? Um, it's about, uh, so Simon, you can see the question. It's about. Okay, so I'm just going to find my way back into the QA. Just uh, if Martin wants to react, uh, she can turn on the microphone. Okay. Um, Known about the alkaloid uh, detox. Yeah, so what is known about alkaloid detoxification of sequestration in a soda? I think so, uh, Martin's uh, microphone is on now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you have the question right now, so you can answer. <laughs> Just yourself. if you want to react or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, actually, not very much. So, so we, so there's a, there's been a series of studies on on the host plants, but not not because they're the host plants of a soda, but because they've got lots of alkaloids by by groups for a while. Um, so we know that we know that they're, they're alkaloidal. Um, there was a study, I have to dig it up. Um, we, we reference it in, in, in the later, in, the, in this paper here, this, this Wolf, Wolf paper on the elevation of gradients, but there's a reference um, in, I think it's in PLOS one, where they, they show that there's an outbreak of um, a really kind of acute respiratory problems in a part of India when when these moths are feeding in high levels on on local fig trees so there's there's a there's a medical condition that kind of uh, response probably to the to the chemicals in 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 the frass of of a soda um, so that's just a kind of observation really that's what what got us thinking that maybe maybe there's something going on I think there's, there's actually very little known about the about the mechanisms about how a soda does it about what exactly the you know, how these how these compounds are are changed as they go from leaf to adult, or or how they how novel compounds are modified from from basal precursors, basically basically nothing. So the nice thing about this data set is that that they, these kinds of data are are there. So we have we have the chemical structures, the the formulas of these, of all the compounds in the leaves, and and what we're hoping to do is to trace. Some of these chemical, these these synthetic pathways from from precursor to product, um, 
by by taking this kind of com comparative approach. Obviously, the ideal way to do it is to is to is to label each compound with an isotope. Um, but this is this is quite quite an, a focused way of doing it because you can't do a whole community per se of, 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 of chemicals. So the, so the short answer is not much, but hopefully soon we'll, we'll be able to tell to have a bit more detail about that, that, that the exact mechanisms. Okay, thank oh, you. Sorry. Wait for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's a, it's a really new data set, but it's yeah. For me, <laughs> for me, it's one of the it's, it's it's one of the most interesting because it, it was an opportunity to really go from something that we'd observed in the field and these big patterns to to, to kind of pin down the natural history and the chemical ecology of an individual organism. Um, but but yeah, no, it's, I'm I'm really excited by these data. And of course, there's all these other things that aren't alkaloids. So there's in the first plot you can see that the separation is actually really really strong so there's huge separation between species and tissue type and then when you when you go down to just alkaloids some of that separation kind of is less distinct there's, some of these things will be amino acids which obviously are, are more present in caterpillars but some of these other things are polyphenols and glycosides stuff that, that, that the caterpillars may well may well try to sequester or, or may well um, kind of try to excrete as, as, as part of their metabolism. But yeah, it's a really, I, I really kind of excited about these, these, these new chemical methods, but I think as long as they're used with, with, with kind of real care and expertise and kind of know exactly what's going on, I think they can be, I think they can be incredibly powerful. Okay. So I think we'll end here because time is running. Uh, people might want to go to lunch. So I, I want to thank, uh, uh, Simon again for uh, for this nice talk and then uh, tell everyone uh, see you next week we have a few more talks until the June so have a nice uh, weekend bye bye okay thanks very much thank you everyone thank thanks you. for listening bye 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 okay thanks guys thanks for that. Thanks to you. Hey, great talk. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I messed up one of the slides. It's sort of those things that must have been, I just missed it. And then it, if you have one mistake in a slide, it throws you off.